I was happy to accept the invitation to speak to Conceptual Foundations, which I have done once before to an earlier generation of uh, MIAs, I think two years ago or three years ago. Um, then I spoke mainly about the book that I asked you to read as part of your assignment for today. Today I will be talking to you about the book I am currently working on, uh, or at least what I will talk to you about today draws on the book I am currently working on, which is about the Cold War uh, in the Middle East, the United States and the Cold War in the Middle East. And so w my topic, which is alternative views of American primacy, um, will base itself on the readings that I asked you to look at, the, my book and the Meyer book, the Charles Meyer book. Um, but also uh, the work that I'm, I'm currently doing on the Cold War in the Middle East. I'm going to talk this afternoon, I hope for less than an hour, um, around four main points. The first is in the current unipolar international system, what exactly is the role of the United States? What is the role of the United States in this current unipolar system? That's my first question, first focus uh, of this afternoon's talk. My second hinges around the question, is the United States an empire? And if so, when did it become one? Um, and this is another question I have been thinking about for a long time. You can see it reflected in Resurrecting Empire. Um, but it is a question I've, I've been thinking about since I finished that book uh, more than more, almost four years ago now, three and a half years ago. My third question more of a historical question, is how does this unipolar system differ from the bipolar system which characterized the Cold War period um, and which differed greatly, obviously, from the multipolar system that preceded it, in other words, before World War II? How does the system we have today, where the United States is clearly the dominant power in a unipolar system, how does it differ from the bipolar system of the Cold War? I will suggest, perhaps, less than we may think. And finally, uh, where is this all going? Um, one of the cheapest lines that I, I favor in talks is to say that as a historian, my job description does not include predicting the future. Um, and I'm not going to predict the future. I'm just going to suggest to you what in the past and in the present might we look at um, to understand where we might be going. So let me start by talking about the situation of the United States in the current international system. What precisely is that situation? Is it a situation of hegemony, whatever that word means? Is it, a, is it a situation of primacy, as the title of the lecture suggests? Is it simply the dominant power, temporary position, which might change uh, in, a, in a short or, or medium, in the short or medium term? Or is it uh, as an imperial power, whatever that term means? Um, Clearly, since the decline and then the disappearance of the Soviet Union, the United States has been essentially unchallenged in the international system. Uh, what, uh, what has it done with this new status of, of unchallenged dominant power? Um, for the first few years after the collapse of the USSR and of the Soviet bloc and of any real power capable of challenging the power of the United States, um, it did not seem entirely clear where the United States was going. Uh, I'm going to talk first about the administration of George Herbert Walker Bush, the, president's, the current president's father. I'll talk briefly about the Clinton administration, and then I will talk about the current administration to show uh, what I mean uh, when I say that it did not initially seem entirely clear uh, where the United States was going. The president who presided over the disappearance of the Soviet Union. Uh, he came into office in January of 1989, and the Soviet Union was in full disintegration. It, dis it, it disappeared the following year. Uh, George Herbert Walker Bush, um, in fact, did appear as if he had some sense of the historic nature of what was occurring on his watch. Both he and his Secretary of State were astute uh, practitioners of international politics. Uh, they were people who had a great deal of experience uh, they were people who were, uh, if not highly articulate, if not visionary, if not charismatic, certainly uh, uh, clear and uh, with a certain sense of how the world operates. And so it was uh, the, the first President Bush who talked about a new world order emerging from the post-Soviet uh, situation 
of uh, a primacy of the United States. Um, at the same time, even though he talked about a, a new world order which would involve peace and cooperation, that was the nature of that speech if you go back to it. Um, this president was willing to use overwhelming force to restore the status quo antebellum in Kuwait after the Iraqi occupation in the 1990-91 uh, first Gulf War. Um, this was in many ways a response which looked like a simple restoration of the old Westfall Westphalian state system, the state system that emerged from the Treaty of Westphalia in 1648, where the modern state system was created. He was just putting back what had been disrupted by the aggression of the Iraqi regime under Saddam Hussein. It seemed, in other words, on the one hand, as if this was not a, 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 in any way a departure. Uh, uh, this was a, a, an action that was run by the United Nations Security Council, approved by the United Nations Security Council, this was an action in which so many countries participated um, that uh, uh, it, it's almost impossible to enumerate them. Every major American ally was involved, including a, a vast range of countries in the Middle East. Every neighbor of Iraq participated overtly or covertly uh, in this operation. Um, and it was thoroughly justified in terms of the UN Charter. So it was not only a restoration of the Westphalian state system, it was also uh, something that was done in terms of the post-World War II international structure that had been established by the victors in that war. Um, on the other hand, by any measure, at the end of this war, the United States had massively increased its presence and its profile in the Middle East. This was a radical change. Some of the people who opposed this war, uh, including my then colleague at the University of Chicago, John Mearsheimer, uh, said at the time and have said since, the reason for opposing this war was not the specifics uh, of Kuwait. That was a situation that had to be resolved. That aggression had to be turned back. It was that, he argued, once the United States went in, it would never go out. He has proven right uh, in a certain respect. Um, uh, in any case, uh, this, th these actions uh, notwithstanding, and President Bush, the first President Bush's avocation of a new world order notwithstanding, I think it can be argued that that four-year presidential term did not see the United States setting out on a clear, unambiguous course uh, for the post-Cold War era. Uh, the same thing can be said of the succeeding eight years of Bill Clinton. Uh, Bill Clinton came into office in January 1993. His administration uh, had, if it had a sense of a new post-Cold War world, that sense seemed to be mainly dominated by uh, a focus on economics and trade. Um, the idea, if there was an idea there, and it's hard to tell whether there really was an organizing idea under the Clinton administration about how to see the world in the post-Cold War era, the idea seemed to be that this new world would be knit together in some way economically or technologically and that uh, no particular attention was required to how the United States would manage its newfound status as a hegemon or a, or, or, or a country that had primacy or whatever uh, the United States was. Uh, there was, I would argue, no vision at all. If President, the first President Bush had a certain vision, um, but it's not clear where exactly that went, I would argue that the Clinton administration had no vision at all. It didn't help that it was adorned by two of the least charismatic secretaries of state in modern history, uh, 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 Christopher, Warren Christopher and Madeleine Albright. Um, however, in the Middle East, which I will come back to again and again, not just because this is the area of my expertise, but because I think it plays a particularly important role, uh, it played an important role in the Cold War, and I think it plays a particularly important role in the post-Cold War world. Uh, the United States had a huge profile under Clinton as well. Just as under the first President Bush, the United States had led this huge coalition and established a large presence in the region, an even larger presence in the region, so under President Clinton um, did the United States play a very major role in terms of uh, Arab-Israeli negotiations during the entirety of the Clinton presidency. Negotiations which of course had been started under the, the first Bush administration, uh, but which were brought to fruition uh, under Clinton. And it also maintained a ferocious sanctions regime in Iraq, which helped in the destruction of that country, the ongoing destruction of that country, which has been completed since the invasion and occupation of the country, but which was largely accomplished by the 10 years of systematic dismantling of the country's infrastructure through sanctions as well as uh, continuous aer aerial bombardment and so forth. The United States had an enormous presence. It established a Kurdish autonomous zone in the north of Iraq. It continued to fly over the country throughout 
uh, and intervene militarily in Iraq, even though it didn't occupy the country, and it maintained, as I've said, this sanctions regime. All of this was to have ominous results uh, as time went on. Uh, I, and I've already said um, that I will come back to why I think the Middle East seems so important in the post-Cold War world um, as it was in the Cold War. Whether it's argued that this is an important fulcrum of world power because of its location, whether it's argued that it's because of the energy resources it contains, uh, whether for some other reason it's sort of a canary in the coal mine, I, in the coal mine, I think we will see um, that the Middle East plays a particularly important role uh, in this, uh, in this post-Cold War era. Finally, let us uh, come to the administration of George uh, W. Bush, which began in January of 2001. Um, in many people's view, I'm not entirely sure I share this, but I share it in part. In many people's view, this administration has changed the behavior of the United States and the world <laughs> in fundamental ways. Uh, in, in Resurrecting Empire, I talk about one of these ways, uh, invading, occupying, and dismantling the government of a major Middle Eastern country is something the United States had never done in its history. Done similar things in Central Asia, in much smaller countries, um, but it had never done such a thing to a major Middle Eastern state um, uh, uh, at any time in, in, in American history. Uh, nor had it done such a thing in, in, in many other parts of the world. Um, this, to, to my way of thinking, by and of itself marked a departure. What then followed the uh, uh, installation of a very large number of U.S. bases, not only in Iraq, but in a whole swath. Um, the establishment of bases, which we're, I'm, I'm sure we're all aware of insofar as Iraq is concerned, did not just take place in Iraq or, for that matter, in Afghanistan. It's taken place in a score of countries running across Africa northern and western Africa, through the Middle East, and well into Central Asia. Um, there's a new command, the Africa Command, which is part of this. There's a whole new structure whereby the United States manages uh, its military power in this part of the world. All of this was done, in particular the invasion of Iraq, without international sanction. All of it was done against the wishes of many key U.S. allies, including most U.S. allies in the region, and several major European and other powers. And it seemed to many as an assertion of a new and more intense uh, form of unilateralism uh, in terms of the U.S. role in the world. Uh, we have to understand it uh, uh, as being coupled with a new national security doctrine that advocated preemption and preventive war, uh, all of this using 9-11 uh, essentially as a pretext because whatever happened on 9-11 had very little to do with the state that we're talking about, Iraq. Uh, and uh, with a much more unilateral, much less checked, much, much less balanced executive branch insofar as uh, 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 foreign policy, war-making powers of the president, and uh, uh, surveillance of citizens was concerned. In all of these areas, uh, what had previously been argued were the necessary checks and balances on the executive seemed to have gone by the board. Um, this. Uh, 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 Coupled with all of this, these things, this move into the Middle East, into North Africa, and into, into Central Asia, uh, can be argued to have marked a new departure in scope, in size, and intensity, even if the United States has had an uninterrupted military presence in the Middle East since 1942. That is the case. Uh, since 1942, for uh, 65 years now, there have, at some, in some place in the Middle East, been American forces and American bases. Since American forces landed in North Africa, in 1942 and landed in Iran in that same year. There's always been an American military presence. But the change in terms of size, scope, and intensity was remarkable. Now, in Resurrecting Empire, I try to suggest that the United States sometimes appears to be playing almost an old-fashioned colonial role, clearly deploying less expertise or less, less competent expertise clearly deploying uh, considerably more power and clearly operating in a very different international situation, in an international situation in which colonialism is a bad word, even if empire is not necessarily. By contrast, American dominance has previously never been exercised in this part of the world in precisely this way. It was previously exercised more indirectly. It was previously exercised, at least in the Middle East and uh, other regions like uh, Africa, South America, and some other parts of the world uh, in ways which 
did not involve uh, what appears to be not just an invasion of a country or an occupation of a country, but a complete refashioning of the country in the image of the occupying power. Um, I could tell you interesting stories about things the United States thought it was going to do about health care in Iraq. They wanted to give them HMOs. They actually walked into that country thinking that this was what we were going to do in Iraq. They were going to bless them with the wonders of uh, insurance companies, bless them with the wonders of HMOs, bless them with the wonderful billing system that we have, bless them with the hundreds of thousands of bureaucrats who eat up a huge proportion of our health care dollar. That was actually what they were going to do. And that's just one tiny, itty, bitty little piece of the picture. They went in and taught them about a common law system in a country which does not have common law. They went in and told them about the privatization of their oil industry in a country which has fought against uh, foreign control of their oil for the moment the country was established. Uh, they were trying to remold that country in their image. That may not be old-fashioned colonialism, but it certainly was reminiscent of that to the Iraqis. Now, you might argue, well, in places like the Dominican Republic, in places like Grenada, in places like Panama, and in earlier interventions in Central America, the Caribbean, and the Philippines, the United States did ju just that. But the United States did those things in that limited sphere. The United States was a Caribbean, Central American, and Pacific power until World War II. It had never done or even tried to do any such thing uh, uh, elsewhere before World War II. And even after World War II, its interventions were, generally speaking, covert uh, uh, elsewhere. And the United States generally eschewed, avoided this form of intervention. Military invasion, occupation, imposition of a new government, long-term basis, an attempt to establish control in some form, direct or indirect, of the country's major resource, which is oil. Now, let me conclude this section by saying that it's not at all clear how much of this is really new. Did what the Bush administration do in terms of unleashing, unleashing the executive from the trammels of congressional checks and balances make that much of a difference? Was the Bush administration that much more unilateral than previous American administrations? Was acting without allies or acting without the United, United Nations so entirely different? I'll leave that to you to think about. Um, it has been argued that it is and that cumulatively this represents a major shift or a major step upwards. Um, but I think it is questionable at least whether that's the case. Secondly, it's not at all clear uh, how long this posture will continue after this administration leaves office in January 2009. To what extent are these permanent changes in the way in which the United States approaches the world? Will the American national security doctrine remain the same? Will the American footprint in the Middle East remain the same? Will the American uh, 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 attempt to link everything e everywhere that happens to terrorism and thereby, uh, and thereby justify American responses continue in a future administration? Uh, it much obviously would depend on who the leader uh, uh, the president and, and his or her administration is, but I think these are questions that are worth asking. Finally, it's not even clear to me whether all of this is sustainable even in the short term between now and January 2009. I'm not entirely sure that we're going to see this situation continue even for the rest of this presidency. I will leave you with those questions and move on now to my second major point. Um, is the United States truly an empire? And if so, how did it become one? Um, part of the definition of empire, I mean, there, there, is there are as many definitions of empire as there are definers. Um, and I'm not going to give you mine, but I'll list a few of the factors I think probably should be considered if we are thinking about whether the United States is an empire and thinking about what an empire is. Part of, I think, anybody's good definition of empire has to do with a system of law, a legal system. Think of the Roman Empire, think of Sharia law, think of the Chinese legal system. These are clear pillars of an imperial system. Another aspect of empire has to do with culture, a shared culture that is either imposed on or is imitated on by uh, uh, subject peoples or by peoples who are not necessarily subjects. Read about the way in which people across the border from the Roman Empire were in effect Romanized. And you'll see the power and attraction uh, of an imperial culture. Um, and uh, the Chinese and the Muslim empires are perfect examples, I think, of both processes, having very powerful legal systems and very powerful cultural attraction, uh, which operated uh, uh, e even across their own frontiers. Uh, Europe was enthralled to Islamic philosophy.
uh, countries all around China aped and imitated, even countries that had not been subjugated by China, aped and imitated Chinese cultural forms. Japan, Korea. Korea, of course, was subjugated by China for a very long period, but Japan never was conquered, and yet it uh, imitated uh, the Chinese example. These are, these are cases where I think law, the legal system, and also the administrative system that follows from that, as well as culture, uh, are certainly important elements in empire. Um, and I think they're important elements in the way in which the United States relates to the rest of the world. Um, in a book that I might have assigned to you, uh, had I read it in time, a book by Cullen Murphy, it's really a long essay entitled, Are We Rome, The Fall of an Empire and the Fate of America? The author suggests another, I think, important pillar of empire. And this is a standing professional military force that is mobile and properly funded. And most good historians of empire will agree on this. You can't have an empire without a standing army. And a standing army means a sustainable financial mechanism to put troops in the field all over, in all directions, at all times, in a way that will not change with uh, a change in leadership, a change in administration, a change in government, a change in emperor, or whatever. Um, all of these things the United States has, obviously, plus others. Uh, and I would lay a great deal of stress on one aspect of American hegemony, whether this amounts to empire or not is another question. And this is the post-World War II financial arrangements, essentially uh, uh, engineered by the United States, at Bretton Woods and afterwards, establishing the International Monetary Fund, establishing the World Bank, and later on leading to things like the World Trade Organization and various free trade agreements. All of these uh, are, are, are the superstructure of an economic system with, which, with the exception of the Soviet bloc for the brief period of the Cold War, became universal. Uh, they were linked to a legal system uh, which is connected to that economic system. Uh, obviously, that legal system didn't penetrate into other states. England still has common law. France still operates on a legal system based on the Napoleonic Code and so forth. But for interchanges between states, more and more, uh, the American legal system is the basis uh, of law. And all of this, I think, indicates an uh, a, a, a enormous set of advantages uh, for the United States. Whether, again, this constitutes empire is another question. One more characteristic of empire, and this is actually crucial, and I think this is where uh, 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 the debate has to center. One more characteristic of empire is a sense of mission and an acceptance of this as part of the self-view of the country or at least of that country's elite. Look carefully at past empires. Look at the Ottoman Empire. Look at, obviously, the Rome or, 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 or China, but look at the Habsburgs. Look at the British Empire. The sense that there was a mission the sense that this is part of the, of the way a people sees itself, the sense that this is one in a chain of empires is clearly an important part of empire. It's not a coincidence that the British ruling cl class was taught not only Greek and Latin classics, but was taught the model of Greece and Rome, and in particular, the model of Rome, such that you could have British prime ministers like Palmerston, uh, who would say, in, in terms of an extension of British power in the Mediterranean, as it happened uh, uh, in the Don Pacifico affair of 1852. Uh, Cius Romanus sum, I am a Roman citizen, i.e., this man, Don Pacifico, who was maltreated, uh, would be protected by the British state, just as the Roman Empire would protect any Roman citizen anywhere in the world. Um, this sense of continuity with other imperial missions and this sense of mission uh, 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 is clearly part of an empire. Um, now, there is a great debate in this country on the topic of empire. Uh, uh, I'm happy to see it. A lot of books are being sold. I'm happy when books are sold. I think that's a good thing. <laughs> books are good. I'm not saying internet, television are bad. Internet and television sell books. So that's very good. Um, <laughs> but it's an indication that people are thinking that there's been such a proliferation of publishing on this subject of empire. Some of it is, of course, repetitive. Some of it is turgid. Some of it is, is jargon-laden. But some of it is really quite intelligent. And there is a debate not just about empire in general, but uh, from Neil Ferguson to a whole range of other authors, some of them quite eminent. Uh, the question of whether the United States is an empire and what constitutes an empire and whether we're approaching this 
uh, has become an enormous topic of, topic of debate. Neil Ferguson has one of the most interesting positions in this. A British historian of British empire is arguing that the United States is of course an empire and saying, you nitwits, get used to it, accept it, shoulder the burdens that you're carrying whether you understand it or not, you are an empire. Behave like one for heaven's sakes, grow up or you have grown up, act like you're grown up. That in essence is what Ferguson is saying. Um, and it is the first time in American history that not just the Fergusons of this world, that's to say imports from Britain who are professors at Harvard, but a whole range of commentators, a whole range of writers at all levels of society are arguing over this and saying, yes, we are an empire or no, we're not an empire. And for the first time, the term imperial or empire is not a term of disapprobation in American public discourse. For the first time, uh, the idea that the United States might be an empire and that that might even be a good thing um, uh, ha has, has at least been broached. Um, now, anyone who knows any American history knows that the United States has always had an outsized, an outsized sense of global mission. Go back to the very first settlers on this continent. Before they had even exterminated the native population, before they had even mastered the continent, they were talking about a city on the hill, a beacon onto the, onto the nations. They were talking in terms which made it clear that they saw that this experiment was universal, or at least had universal applicability. But they were not talking about applying it themselves. They were not talking about bringing democracy by gunboat or by Apache helicopter or whatever. They saw it as a city on a hill. They weren't going to march into the valley to the next hill. Okay? It was a beacon to the nations. It wasn't going to go and, you know, with torches into the nations. So there was an outsized sense of mission in terms of what the United States was seen as embodying. But it was something that was balanced, always balanced in the past, by a certain native isolationism, by a deep wariness of foreign entanglements from President Washington's first, uh, sorry, from the... Uh, Farewell speech of President Washington, the first president, this warning against foreign entanglements is a constant theme um, uh, from the founders and the framers and later from other uh, l American leaders. Uh, and it was always balanced uh, by the checks and balances uh, instituted by the founders and the framers. Uh, war is made by the executive. The power of the state is expanded abroad by the executive. But the executive has to get money from Congress. Executive has to operate on the basis of declaration of war to be issued by Congress. And this, was all, this always functioned, at least in the 18th and the 19th century and into the 20th century, uh, well into the 20th century, as a check uh, on the actions of the executive. Um, now, I would argue that those limitations on America's unbounded sense of mission in the world are much weaker today than they have been, uh, at least uh, since the first half of the 20th century. There are many reasons for this. Um, one of them is that the United States is so much more powerful. Only in World War II did Americans realize just how powerful their country was. Uh, the United States didn't even have an intelligence service before World War II. The United States had no foreign language expertise before World War II. The United States had a small diplomatic service, it had a very large navy, but it had a limited army and a limited air force. After World War II, it suddenly became the biggest in so many respects, most importantly economically. The war spurred the United States until the point that at the end of the war, the United States produced about half of the world's GDP. The United States was inordinately superior to all other countries put together in terms of many indices of raw power starting in World War II. And obviously that changed the way people saw themselves. I think one of the most fascinating historical questions is how that generation of leadership from the late 30s uh, through the 40s changed their view of what the United States was and how it functioned in the world. And I think that that has to be understood if we are to understand not only the Cold War but where we are today. Because that is the beginning of the linking of this outsized sense of mission of the United States, which until that point had been restrained in a variety of ways, to global power, which the United States was in a position with fleets on every sea, bases on every continent, to exercise, which it did not have before World War II. The United States was a Caribbean and Pacific power before World War II. It was not a global power. It had occasionally, briefly intervened in the world in a limited way and then withdrawn. Now it was everywhere and it stayed everywhere.
and that changed uh, everything. Um, I think one thing I want to touch on before I go on is the linkage between war and expansion on the one hand and executive power on the other. I've said that the executive has to make war. You can't have a parliament making war. You can't have a congress making war. You can't have any kind of deliberative body making war. You have to have a hierarchical military command headed by an executive power, an executive branch, whoever that is, however that's organized. In an autocracy, that's easy. In, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in an absolute monarchy, obviously, that's very simple. But in a democracy, it's a little more complicated. And if you look at this, it, it is possible to have a certain degree of oversight in a democracy by the representative body, whether it's a congress or a parliament or a national assembly, over the expansion of empire. Look at the way in which the British parliament tried and in some cases successfully managed the expansion of the British empire. Look at the way in which the French assembly in the 19th century and into the 20th uh, managed the uh, expansion uh, of the French empire. Look at our congress in the wake of the, the, the Spanish-American War of 1898. War, however, especially modern war, uh, is, is much harder to manage, as I've said. You can't do it by committee. Especially a war which involves the entire society, which modern war, post-Napoleonic war, has increasingly become. Uh, in this sense, where you have a nation in arms, uh, uh, the elected representative chief executive who operates within checks and balances in situation of peace suddenly becomes not just the president, but the commander in chief. This is a term which, not coincidentally, this president uses much, much more than almost any, any of his predecessors. And it's not a coincidence. He sees himself as a president at war, but he also sees the power of the president in a circumstance of war as being the kinds of powers that an American president should have and in a war that, without end, should always have. And this has all kinds of implications if you think about the historical precedents for what happens to the American system. Think of major democracies at war in the 20th century. Think of, say, Britain, France, and the United States in World War I and World War II. Think of Clemenceau. Think of Lloyd George. Think of President Wilson. Think of Churchill. Think of Roosevelt. All of these democratically elected leaders in well-established constitutional democracies had the functional equivalent of dictatorial powers during these wars. In a sense, they had to. They were fighting to total wars against centrally organized foes. Wilhelmine Germany, Nazi Germany, uh, 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 Japan during World War II. Um, the interesting thing is that in principle at the end of the war, these powers are supposed to be handed back. And in most cases they were. Lloyd George, uh, uh, Churchill lost office soon after their respective wars. Wilson was repudiated by the US Senate within two years of the end of World War I. In the United States case, however, think about it for a second. Those powers were not fully revoked. Why were they not fully revoked? Because as soon as World War II ended, the Cold War began. As soon as the war to end all wars ended, the United States entered into a decades-long uh, Cold War with the Soviet Union. Um, and this obviously uh, prevented the devolution or the return of powers, uh, which the executive branch had monopolized uh, uh, to uh, uh, Congress or other parts of, of, of government. Uh, the Korean War accentuated and intensified this process. Uh, and we eventually had what uh, Daniel Juergen in one of his earlier books called the, a national security state, a state in which there were permanent organs of executive power, which in, in essence were beyond the purview of Congress. So you didn't have checks and balances. Look at the defense budget and ask yourselves, is this really under the control of anybody? Look at. American intelligence operations. Are these really under congressional oversight? And what does that mean? Uh, what does that mean for what, what, what the, the, the very nice words written with quill pens uh, in the Constitution? Um, now, having said that, I'm not suggesting that this was an uninterrupted march of the accretion of executive power. Uh, uh, of all people, a five-star general, a former president of this institution, Dwight D. Eisenhower, perceived the danger of this. And in his farewell address, farewell addresses are very good things in many cases. In his farewell address, he gave one of the most prescient, intelligent, far-reaching uh, arguments against that process, describing the encroachment of what he called a military-industrial complex and how it made democratic governance impossible. 
It's a very important speech by someone who knew more about the military-industrial complex than any American president. He had com commanded the entirety of US forces, uh, of allied forces, in the uh, western theater of Europe. Uh, up to and through the Normandy invasion and right up to the defeat of Germany. He knew a lot about the military industrial complex uh, and was a, 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 a quite adept wielder of executive power. Um, the Vietnam War, nevertheless, thereafter, greatly expanded these powers, even though Eisenhower, in some measure, tried to restrain them. Um, and uh, even though this was followed by a reaction, Congress reacted, public opinion reacted to the Vietnam War, uh, and we had a whole series of acts that attempted to limit the untrammeled power of the executive from the War Powers Act of 1973 to the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act of 1978. It was clear that there were powerful forces within government and within society that wanted to burst the bounds that Congress had placed. Um, certainly, the Reagan administration represented an attempt to break those bounds. The Reagan administration of, in the, in the Iran-Contra uh, uh, scandal uh, was in fact trying to break these very bounds that had been placed on the, on the powers of, of the executive uh, by Congress. Um, these and other acts which had attempted to curtail the power of the executive to act abroad uh, were the targets not only of the Reagan administration, but of people who had been present at the, at, at the moment when these acts were passed. As, as key figures in the, in the late Nixon and Ford administration, uh, Richard Cheney and Don Rumsfeld were people who clearly believed that a grave, grave, grave wrong had been done in limiting the power of the president. And they've spent their whole careers right up through the roles they played in the present administration trying to turn back the clock very successfully, obviously, in the last six or seven years. So I think. It could be argued that this process has now provoked, this process of continued accretion of power in the hands of the executive, has now provoked a reaction to what many people call an imperial presidency. But I think you have to be very, I think you have to be very cold in looking at this phenomenon of a reaction to the re, redefined, infinitely more uh, 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 potent executive. And I think you have, to, you have to see that really this has so far been just essentially chatter and no more, talk about limiting the, the power of the executive. Uh, so far there has been absolutely no action to reverse one single action, one single law, one single uh, prerogative arrogated to the president by his helpers, handlers, enablers, uh, by the Congress or by anybody else in this society. Um, and it doesn't seem to me, from what I've seen of the presidential campaign so far, as if there will be much done in the next administration to roll back some of these accretions of presidential power. Um, we will see. But the, 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 uh, the indices will be things like the defense budget. The indices will be the military footprint of the United States. The indices will be the power of the state to listen in on everything we say and do if it decides for some reason that we are a danger. Um, and I, I wonder whether, in fact, we will see the kind of rollback after Iraq, if Iraq ends, as we saw after Vietnam. Let me move now to my third uh, and last substantive point, which is, is the United States an empire? And if so, when did it become one? The conventional wisdom, I'm sorry, my, my third point is not that. My third point is, how does this unipolar, I apologize. My third point is how does this unipolar system that we are now blessed with differ from the bipolar system that preceded it uh, during the Cold War? The conventional wisdom regarding the Cold War is that the United States and the Soviet Union essentially balanced one another off. Yes, uh, uh, this is true in that the US nuclear monopoly until 1949 was matched by a vast superiority of the Soviet Union in conventional forces. Yes. This idea of some kind of balance is true uh, in that even though the United States encircled the Soviet Union rather than the other way around, they didn't contain us, we contained them. Uh, the Soviet Union still had the power uh, through its own forces in Europe or through its allies in East Asia to break out of that uh, containment, out of that encirclement. Uh, after Sputnik and after the development of intercontinental ballistic missiles, both powers had the capacity to destroy one another. 
and we had a nuclear balance of terror. So in all of those senses, there is some truth to this conventional wisdom that the United States and the Soviet Union balance one another. I would point out to you, however, that in other areas, this was simply not true. Look at economics. Look not just at growth rates. Look at the sheer gargantuan size, not only of the American economy, but of the other economies that were incorporated into the same system under Bretton Woods, into the same system with the dollar as the basic currency. All of the economies of Europe, all, except obviously Eastern Europe under Soviet occupation. The major economies of Asia, of Asia starting with Japan, uh, uh, excluding, of course, uh, China until recently. Uh, all of these together dwarfed the Soviet economy and the economies of all other states uh, that had commun communist governments. Uh, as I've said, the United States at the end of World War II had half of world GDP. Its proportion of world G GDP has declined, but the proportion of world GDP within the ambit of the American dominated economic system has over always been overwhelmingly larger than that of the so-called socialist system. Second thing to look at is that even though the Soviet Union had enormous power in the areas I talked about, conventional weapons and later on a formidable nuclear arsenal, the United States had bases and forces everywhere, even on the peripheries of the Soviet Union. With the exception of the odd Soviet base in the Middle East or Africa or Cuba, uh, that was not the case for the Soviet Union. By contrast, the Soviet Union was generally in a position of having to worry about could the United States strike the Soviet mainland from bases all around the Soviet Union, whereas the United States uh, was not in the same position. And this was important not just in terms of the nuclear balance between them or the conventional balance between them. It was also uh, important in terms of projecting power uh, and dominating regions. Finally. Um, I would argue that in, in a variety of indices of state power, uh, starting with economics and the bases, but also other intangible ones, uh, cultural, cultural power, uh, uh, the United States and its allies were more powerful than the Soviet Union. Certainly in the Middle East, the area that I know the most about, uh, the United States appears in hindsight almost to be a hegemonic power, from the, pretty much from the beginning of the Cold War. Uh, it is. It is, it, is, it is certainly the dominant power by the 1970s in the Middle East. Uh, the Soviet Union is still challenging it vigorously in the 1970s as it's challenging American power in Africa, as it's challenging American power in, Soviet, in, Central, in Central, Africa, uh, Central America in the 1980s. But uh, uh, in the Middle East, and I would argue in most other regions of the world, the United States appears to be the dominant power from about the middle of the Cold War onwards. There is a contest, but there is not much of a contest. And you can see why this happens with something like the American capture of Egypt from the Soviets. Uh, if you look at what happened under Sadat, this had much more to do with the Cold War, much more to do with the United States and the Soviet Union dueling for influence in the Middle East than it had to do with peace. You might have noticed that there is not peace between the Arabs and the Israelis, even though there is peace between Egypt and Israel. Uh, this was in part, of course, about achieving an Egyptian-Israeli peace. But if you read Kissinger's memoirs, if you look at what he was trying to do, he understood that the United States had enormous advantages and could just take the major Arab country out of the Soviet column and put it into the American column. And it proceeded to do that. And it did that with exactly the, the panoply of weapons that I've talked about, the economic, the military, and the cultural. All of these operated almost without, almost without fail uh, to bring the most important Soviet ally in the Arab world into uh, uh, an alliance with the United States, in, which has lasted for almost three decades now, two and a half decades now. Uh, I could give you other examples of, 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 of indications in the Middle East that the United States, even if it was not a hegemonic power during the Cold War, certainly was the dominant power. Israeli military dominance over the Arab countries. Israel was a proxy as the Arab countries were proxies in several of these wars. Uh, starting in 67. Israel won them all handily in the end. Um, and this, again, was something that was beneficial to the United States uh, in terms of its Cold War rivalry with the Soviet Union. The control of oil. The American position in Saudi, in Saudi Arabia is cemented in 1933. President Roosevelt, at death's door, goes to meet Ibn Saud in 1945, 10 weeks before he dies. Obviously, Saudi Arabia is considered a very important country by the United States. And ever since the 30s, 
ever since the 30s, Saudi Arabia has been integral to the American uh, 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 system. And uh, Saudi Arabia is only one of a number of countries in which the United States has achieved a par paramount position insofar as oil is concerned. Um, ironically, it's only in the closing phases of the Cold War and in the period after the Cold War and the Iranian Revolution that any real challenge to American dominance in the region came. And it did not come from the Soviets or from Soviet proxies. It came from the Iranian Islamic regime um, and its allies. Now, the Cold War system, even if it was dominated by the United States, certainly differed from the interwar and pre-World War I systems, uh, at least in the Middle East and I would argue in most other, other regions of the globe. Britain was the dominant power for most of the interwar period and for much <laughs> of the pre-World War I period. But it dominated a multipolar system in which there were many challengers. Germany under the, under the Kaiser and later on uh, Nazi German, Germany, uh, France in various periods, Italy, and so forth. Um, and Britain faced strong nationalist resistance. Nevertheless, Brit British domination was clear during most of, these, most, of these, most of this period. By contrast, in the Cold War period, there were obviously only two powers. It was a bipolar system. There was a high degree of polarization which affected most countries in the Middle East and many other regions eventually. Um, and interestingly enough, much mobilization of nationalism during the height of the Cold War functioned along Cold War lines. Nationalism was often manipulated by or uh, uh, operated in alignment with the superpowers uh, in much of the Middle East. Uh, as a result, I think, uh, we find American dominance, which I find quite clear, uh, very much masked to most analysts, and I think to many people in the Middle East for most of the Cold War. I remember conversations in Beirut in the late 70s and the early 80s with people who were really quite knowledgeable. And they talked about the Soviet Union as if it was, in some respects, superior to the United States in terms of power and ability to project that power in the Middle East. And I said to them, what Middle East are you looking at? How can you possibly see the Soviet Union as superior to the United States? It's massively inferior to the United States in every major index of power even where it has positions in the Middle East. These are countries which are virulently anti-communist. Their regimes are anti-communist. The Ba'ath regime in Iraq slaughtered communists. Whereas in a country like Morocco, a country like Saudi Arabia, a country like Israel, any of the countries aligned with the United States, the elites were capitalists through and through. They believed in the nature of the American system. They believed in the nature of the world system dominated by the United States. They were completely convinced allies of the United States. This was simply not true of most Soviet clients in the Middle East. I would argue it was not true of most Soviet clients in the world. There were exceptions. Cuba, obviously. Nicaragua, a few others. South Yemen. But these were really glaring exceptions. Uh, even where people adopted a socialist system, they were most definitely not communists. And many of them were virulent anti-communists, certainly in the Middle East. And I think this is, this is important uh, to recognize. Um, only really, I think, after the end of the Cold War, when we looked back, did some analysts say, well, you know, the United States actually was stronger than it appeared to us at the time. Um, and, and, and as we look back now, I think that uh, uh, American, American power was even greater uh, than, than I thought uh, at the time. Let me conclude uh, by talking about where all of this may take us. I, I, I repeat my, uh, my injunction. I'm not going to predict the future. I, don't, I can't do that. I don't do that. Um, it's very clear, this is clear, that the end of the Cold War, which might have, and by any rational, by any rational calculation, should have brought a peace dividend, which might have, and by any rational calculation, should have brought a major, profound change in behaviors and in the nature of the international system. Uh, the end of the Cold War did no such thing. It didn't bring an end to US bases around the world whose existence had been justified by the Soviet threat. It didn't bring uh, a change in the American presence in many parts of the world. Um, it certainly didn't bring a fundamental change to the American defense budget. Um, the Gulf War, the first Gulf War, the various interventions in the Balkans, the uh, uh, the various ideas put forward by liberal interventionists, which seem to me to be a justification of the United States behaving in exactly the same way on different pretexts uh, as it behaved during the Cold War. 
and now the global war on terror, the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, all of these things, these occupations, these wars, uh, this new presence justified on these bases have all combined to leave the United States in largely the same position as it was in when a lethally armed Soviet Union that actually could destroy the United States and actually posed an existential threat to our existence uh, in this country existed. Uh, uh, we're told that the, the, the war on terror involves a threat of the level of World War II. And I just would remind you, or, or the Cold War for that matter, I would just remind you that in World War II, you had powers that had ambitions to dominate the entire world, impose their system, and might have had the capability to do that. There was, in other words, an existential threat. The Cold War, similarly, involved a confrontation between powers that could have destroyed each other, both of their societies, and much of the known world. There was, in other words, an existential threat. Now, terrorism poses an awful threat to the security of many thousands, maybe tens of thousands of individuals, but it does not pose an existential threat to this society, or as far as I can tell, most societies. It is not, as far as I can tell, by any rational calculation, on anything like the same level of danger to our existence as societies, as free people, as individuals in the mass as either the totalitarian regimes of World War II or uh, uh, the, the Cold War uh, uh, nuclear standoff between the United States and the Soviet Union was. Nevertheless, uh, we, as, I, as I've suggested, um, the peace dividend has not come about. The changes in behavior that I've talked about haven't come about. It's as if the engine of a car disappeared, but the car just kept rolling along without an engine. I mean, all of this was justified once upon a time by the Cold War, the Soviet threat, communism, remember? I, many of you may be too young to remember. There was once upon a time a thing called communism in the Soviet Union. It disappeared 18, 19 years ago. But it was a big deal. And that was the justification for everything the United States did everywhere. Every base, every foreign aid bill, the National Defense uh, Education Act on the basis of which many of us were trained in foreign languages and so on and so forth. All of this was justified by the Cold War. Cold War ends, Soviet, War disappe Soviet Union disappears, nothing changes. The vehicle just keeps rolling on as if nothing had happened. Something is in there under the hood, but it's not the Cold War. It's not the Soviet Union, whatever it may be. Um, the Cold War uh, has been replaced by whatever it is that the United States is facing, whether it's, as some people say, Islamo-fascism, or whether it is a global war on terror, or whether it is simply several discrete, separate, specific wars in specific places and specific terrorist threats. However you define it, something holds up this system. And we now seem to be moving into what appears to be a Cold War with Iran, uh, focused around terrorism, focused around nuclear issues, focused around a number of things. Um, and uh, 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 all of this apparently uh, serves to fulfill the function uh, previously served by the Soviet Union, uh, justifying a defense budget, justifying bases all over the world, justifying a forward military policy, things like the Africa Command. Uh, and if you look carefully, the Middle East is central to much of this. Um, now, we know, anybody who pays any attention to the American budget knows that there are powerful and the budget process and how the budget is produced. Everybody who looks at these things carefully knows that there are powerful economic and po political interests that are at stake in all of this. Uh, there is a plane called the F-A-22 Raptor, which is built in more states than I can name which therefore has more Congress and, and more senators allied to its construction than I can name. This is a plane which at one point was supposed to cost under $100 million a pop, was then budgeted $225 million a pop. Its opponents now say that the unit cost of this single airplane has gone up to $355 million a pop. Uh, each individual airplane will cost $355 million if this estimation is correct. This was an aircraft which was designed to achieve air superiority over the Red Air Force. That is to say, for those of you who don't know what the Red Air Force is, the Air Force of the defunct Soviet Union. We are building sheep, uh, ships designed to achieve superiority over the Red Navy, which is rusting to the bottom of the Black Sea and the Baltic, even as we speak. Um, this is obviously a process which has a, 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 an inertia, a dynamism, a, a force uh, to it, um, which uh, uh, is beyond uh, uh, discussion in rational terms. 
it's not clear how any of these things would be in use in actual wars in which the United States is engaged in Iraq, in Afghanistan, wherever. But these, these weapon systems are still being built. Uh, most of the things that are still being built, the, the, the Osprey, I don't know if, you, if you're a fan of tilt rotor aircraft, the Osprey was just uh, entered into service. It's a, it's a sort of a helicopter. It can both fly and, and like an airplane and land. It costs humongous amounts of money. It has one weakness. It's vulnerable to desert climates. <laughs> I'm actually not kidding you. And they are building a large number of these at costs that would make, you know, make it easy to educate everybody for free in this country uh, very well. And you wouldn't have to pay all those loans um, if we stopped building them. And they won't work very well, I promise you. They, they crash during tests and so on and so forth. So we have a process which clearly doesn't work very well. Now, if you look at an article that was written by a very, very famous historian uh, by the name of Emmanuel Wallerstein, entitled, The Eagle Has Crash Landed, which he published in Foreign Policy in the July-August 2002 issue, you'll see the argument that these kinds of military expenditures have in the past sapped other great empires and that they are already harming the United States in comparison to its rivals. Wallerstein, who is the, is the person who first developed and, and proposed the idea of world systems and looking at a very long period of time, argues that over a very long period of time, these kinds of pointless, wasteful military expenditures uh, will harm the United States. And these are things that America's rivals, Russia, India, China, Europe, and so forth, are, are not doing. They're spending less. Uh, they're spending much less as a share of their GDP. Uh, all have higher growth rates. And uh, all, he argues, will sooner or later reap the benefits of not making this kind of foolish expenditures. We will see what all of this means for the future. Um, many authors, Colin Murphy, whose book Are We Rome, I mentioned to you, and others, suggest that superior military power, in fact, can keep an empire on top for a while. Uh, Emmanuel Wallerstein's analysis and that of others says the opposite. Certainly, the United States has unrivaled military power. However, one of the things that the wars that this country is fighting in Afghanistan and Iraq has shown is that with that kind of overwhelming power comes the natural inclination of an opponent to use asymmetrical warfare, to use means that are not going to bring that opponent face to face with the crushing power that the United States can bring to bear. And I think the outcomes that my generation witnessed as teenagers and, and college students in Vietnam and that your generation, I think, may well witness in Iraq and in Afghanistan over the medium term will show uh, that perhaps military power uh, is not capable of determining outcomes always and everywhere. In any case, um, you will be able to judge for yourselves within a few years if the pendulum will swing back to a more modest world role for the United States. I would suggest to you that when you look at whether that is happening, you consider my metaphor of the Middle East as a canary in the coal mine. If the United States has large numbers of military forces and many bases in the Middle East, that diminution of American power, that more modest position of the United States in the world will not have been achieved. Uh, or you will see if the United States does against all logic, decide to keep a long-term military presence in Iraq, uh, 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 whether, in fact, uh, this will prove to be sustainable and what other uh, uh, outcomes may result from that. Um, or, uh, having forbid, what other military adventures, whether in Iran or elsewhere, the United States will enter into. Whether the United States is an empire or not, I actually do not know. I'm not going to answer that question for you. Um, I will say, however, uh, that the United States has in some respects, truly untrammeled power. It's the most powerful state uh, in human history. Um, but at the same time, uh, there are clear uh, areas where that power is simply unable to dictate outcomes. I think that the Middle East may prove to be uh, one of those areas. And so I suggest you look very carefully at it in the future. Thank you very much.